Who would have thought that in the center of Florence in Italy is a giant part of ancient Egypt? For centuries, thousands of Egyptian artifacts have been scattered throughout the world in some of Europe's best museums and private collections. We investigate the enemies, the queens, the treasures, and a mysterious pharaoh. Priceless treasures from explorers and treasure hunters in the city that drew the men who discovered Tutankhamun together. Come with to see the forgotten treasures of Egypt. Tucked away here in Firenze at the Pitti Palace in the Boboli Gardens are ancient relics, some from the 16th century. But come on, the 16th century was just like the other day. I'm more interested in 3,300 year old objects. At the very center of the Boboli Gardens is one of the oldest objects in Florence on public display, apart from anything in the museum. It is a giant obelisk commissioned by Pharaoh Ramses II. This obelisk hails from a set of twin obelisks from Heliopolis, now near modern-day Cairo. Most Egyptologists are aware of 13 obelisks that were taken to Rome. However, this information is incorrect. There were actually 14. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. Delve into the history of the ancients with History Hit's exclusive offering of documentaries. Explore with us the enchanting Temple of Karnak or take a deep dive into the fascinating prehistory of Scotland. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. In the first century AD, this obelisk was moved to Rome by Domitian and placed in the Temple of Isis in Campus Martius. Along with other obelisks, it was placed near the Pantheon. The famous Medici family claimed this obelisk for their own personal collection. This 9-ton, 6-meter obelisk was taken from Rome and brought to Firenze on an epic 4-month journey and finally placed here at the center of the Pitti Palace. adorned by a modern brass orb. This is a very unique obelisk because at the very pinnacle is the sacred scarab beetle holding up the sun. I'm very fortunate that I can read and understand the glyphs on this obelisk and what we have is a very special name for the king, his Horus name. This name is indicated by a golden falcon wearing the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, above a temple containing the pharaoh's name. Here Ramses is called the Strong Bull, followed by his throne name, Usir Maedra Setapenra, the Son of the Sun, his birth name, Ramses, the House of Osiris, the one that pleases Ra and the God's body, Ramses, beloved of Amun and Ra, Lord of the city Inu, the other side lists his throne name, as well as titles, including the Lord of Many Lands, the one who has overcome his enemies, the one who pleases Atum, the son of the sun, Ramses II, 
ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt, the justice of the strong bull, topped again by the symbol of the rising sun. The obelisk was connected to the sun god Ra and would catch the first rays of light from the rising sun every morning. Ramses II commissioned the largest number of these monolithic structures hewn from red granite in Aswan. Apart from this treasure from my favorite pharaoh, Florence has many more amazing secrets from ancient Egypt that I want to show to you. Not only is there a giant obelisk, but there is also an obscure museum with an interesting connection to the men who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. Harry Burton, Lord Carnarvon, and Howard Carter. We do Egyptology because we love sharing stories from the ancient world. So, it upsets me so much when an organization such as a museum does not want to take part in a documentary which is ultimately going to help promote their museum and promote the importance of history towards the general public. I see museums exploiting these ancient artifacts in a disrespectful manner, whether it be by having music videos being shot there. We saw this at the museum in Turin where we had Mahmoud, an Italian singer, performing in front of sacred statues. In my opinion, distasteful. We see Beyonce sneaking cameras into museums to shoot music videos. We even see the Great Pyramid of Giza being used on a BBC show, lit up with thousands of candles inside the burial chamber. How does this help the story of history when all we're doing is dumbing it down? It is a museum's duty to help promote their pieces and their artifacts while keeping those artifacts safe. And by letting someone come in with a camera, obviously not using a flash or lights or things like that, letting them come in and showcase these pieces will help spread the word and in this day and age where everything's all virtual and TikTok and things like that, I think it is so important that we get back to showing people how important history is. I don't see any difference between a vlog and my documentaries. The only difference is I might put more time in and more effort in, into the production. Now, because I am so passionate about telling you the viewer stories about ancient Egypt and sharing knowledge of the ancient world. I'm going undercover to show you some of the most amazing treasures held here in Florence at the Museo Archeologico. Since Florence was founded by Julius Caesar, many of the Egyptian artifacts in this museum were discovered in the 1500s in the remains of ancient Roman villas. This massive oil painting showing Jean-Francois Champollion, the man who deciphered the hieroglyphs from the Rosetta Stone, and Impolito Rossellini, his trusted artistic friend. When these two men met in Tuscany in 1824, they revolutionized Egyptology. In 1828, on an expedition to document the history of Egypt, Rossellini and Champollion returned and donated 2,000 artifacts to this museum. The history of Egypt is even more ancient than we could have imagined. In this museum, the history is laid out in chronological order, with some artifacts dating back to over 10,000 years ago, to pre-dynastic period. These clay pots show boats and bird life, such as flamingos, laying out the foundations for Egyptian art and religion. These pots were placed into simple pit graves, the fundamental beginnings of one of ancient Egypt's most important practices.
ancient Egyptian grave offerings have been around since the pre-dynastic period, since the next life was pretty much like this life, only better. The complex system of offerings began to evolve after time. Early offerings in sandy pit graves were simply placed inside clay pots. When mud brick tombs began to appear, more elaborate offerings for the dead were found. This beautiful wooden statue of a woman delicately decorated with flowers on her blue necklace and her short haircut shows her in everyday life making beer. Such statues from the 5th dynasty would enact the function that they are performing in the afterlife for eternity. For those who could not afford tomb wall inscriptions, these figurines served the same spiritual and functional purpose. Shown here grinding grain down to make flour in order to bake bread was so fundamental to the ancient Egyptians that almost everybody wanted to be buried with thousands of loaves of bread. This was much easier than actually filling your tomb with bread. From the 11th dynasty onwards, they realized that it wasn't enough just to have food offerings to eat. You had to be able to get around in the afterlife. And furthermore, you had to actually get to the afterlife. The spiritual journey to enter heaven was taken by boat. Miniature sailboats with oars and rowers would serve this purpose for the spirit of the deceased. A practice that shifted and morphed into a deeper spiritual meaning hundreds of years later. However, some who were of a more higher class and who were offered tombs on behalf of the Pharaoh could have their offerings carved magically onto the walls rather than being left physical offerings, such as the vizier and the mayor of Memphis, Mary. His name written before him and appearing in the typical 5th dynasty costume. This fragment from his tomb shows that he received thousands of offerings Listed here thousands of beer, thousands of linen, thousands of beef, and thousands of geese, all to be taken to the afterlife. This beautiful wine cup, found in Armana, probably was drunk out of by Pharaoh Akhenaten. It is in the shape of the sacred Egyptian flower, the blue lotus, a symbol that has been around for thousands of years. This woman from the Old Kingdom was the mother of the mayor of Memphis. She is shown sniffing a lotus flower. The ancient Egyptians believed that the scent of the lotus could open the mind. A small glyph of her son shows that he was the mayor. To them, the lotus flower had many meanings. Linked with sexual arousement, both men and women were often shown smelling the lotus. This perfumed flower was linked to the god of beauty and incense, named Nefertem. An abundant number of harem women are shown wearing the lotus on their brow as a way to entice the pharaoh. Because Nefertem emerged from the lotus, it became the symbol of rebirth and was depicted in almost every Egyptian tomb and temple. The lotus flower also became the symbol for Upper Egypt. Its symbolism and purpose were vastly variable, and if you try to count how many scenes depict the lotus flower, you 
will be astounded. We know much about the ancient Egyptians because they chose to write down everything in a sacred script called by the Greeks hieroglyphs, which literally translates to sacred carvings. And their use went from the mundane everyday life to defining their religion. Between the 7th and 11th dynasty, Egypt experienced its Dark Age. Today we call it the First Intermediate Period. Following the long reign of Pharaoh Pepi II, small independent nomarchs began to rise in power. Egypt was divided between smaller states, and so the art began to fail. A sad example is the Stela of Nofret. By the 11th dynasty, things began to pick up again. In Thebes, a smaller known god named Montu, the god of war, began to rise in prevalence. A Theban army general named Montuhotep aimed to reunite Egypt. The overseer of the estates of the god Montu tells us that Egypt's wealth began to rise yet again and funerary offerings became commonplace once more. With Montehotep becoming pharaoh and reuniting Egypt once more, the pouring out of funerary offerings became abundant. And this pharaoh revolutionized Egyptian literature and art. The Middle Kingdom style is very distinctive. The man in front shown with his wife behind, holding his shoulder in support. And before them, an offering of wine and bread is poured out. This couple who lived at Abydos are probably foreigners, because of the different facial features, as well as both of their bodies being painted in a dark red color. Whereas in the Middle Kingdom, men were painted red and women were painted yellow. The 11th dynasty saw a resurgence in beauty, linking back to the 6th dynasty during the reign of Pharaoh Pepi and Merenre. These alabaster cups belonging to Merenre was quite a common drinking vessel during the Old Kingdom Sixth Dynasty. Merenre started showing interest in Nubia in the south, leaving Egypt's borders to the north unprotected. A trend that continued from the Sixth Dynasty all the way to the Twelfth. Don't lose your head over the statue. It is actually a Middle Kingdom statue, probably from Sesostris, but it was reused by Pharaoh Zamtik. Introducing a line of three ruthless warrior pharaohs named Sesostris. Although Sesostris is the Greek version of his name, his real name in ancient Egyptian reads as the man of the goddess Wazret, Sen Wazret. Sesostris I was indeed a mighty warrior, spreading Egypt's empire to Nubia, Libya, and creating political ties in the north. What I love here is we see Sesostris in the form of Amu with the feathers on his head, with the god Montu next to him, Montu identified by the two cobras on his brow, and obviously we can read his name. But what is so interesting is Montu has on these ropes 
He has the enemies, the nine so-called enemies. Obviously, they had more than nine enemies, but these are the nine major enemies. And they are all tied up here, and we can tell that these are different from cartouches. Around the name, we actually have what is like a city wall. So that is the city, the civilization, that the pharaoh and the god have conquered, and they are tying up here. By the time of the rule of Sesostris II, a period of peace and prosperity spread throughout the land. With building and agricultural focuses in the Fayum Oasis and Sinai, Sesostris II even allowed foreigners to begin to move into certain areas in Egypt. This would have dire consequences by the time of his successor. The infamous tyrannical ruler Sesostris III. Sesostris III reinforced Egypt's power in the south in Nubia, having many military campaigns and building fortresses to protect the borders. However, he began to allow smaller independent regional rulers to have their own say. The internal political system began to crumble. Down the line of the 12th dynasty after Amunemhat IV came Egypt's first female pharaoh. With no clear male heirs to the throne, Sobek Neferu became the pharaoh. With her legacy ending the 12th dynasty, the invaders, the foreigners from the north, known as the Hyksos, took power over Egypt. These foreigners, or Hyksos, took power from the north in their settlement area of Avaris dividing Egypt up once again into its second intermediate period. With several ruling states, north were the Hyksos, in the middle the rulers at Abydos and the Thebans. Even the Nubian Kushites to the south wanted power. The 13th dynasty saw the end of the Pyramid Age. By the 17th dynasty, burial practices became less important. Those who still wanted burial goods during the Second Intermediate Period leave us with these unskilled, self-made carvings. Yet these invaders introduced the Egyptians to their most fantastic invention. An invention that would bring the Egyptians' battle tactics to a new level. The fast and flexible four-spoke horse war chariot. This invention would ultimately lead the Egyptians to reclaiming their country. An independent Egyptian ruler began to fight back. War had broken out throughout Egypt. Sikinin Retao, a local Theban ruler, raised up his army against the Hyksos invasion. However, dying brutally in battle, his son, Ahmos, took up arms and defeated the Hyksos, founding the 18th dynasty. On this touching stela, we can see young Ahmos clutching at his father's leg. And behind the young prince is his trusty pet dog. It is a common misconception that the Egyptians were extreme lovers of cats. They had many forms of pets, including cats. However, cats were never given human names. They were simply referred to as a meow, and a dog could be given any given name. 
Actually, small felines such as domestic cats were seen more for the common people, whereas dogs were seen of a higher class. We know that some pharaohs, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, had pet lions. Some people in Egypt even adopted pet monkeys. In some higher class families, we know that they even hired attendants to groom and care for the monkeys. Animals in ancient Egypt were held of a very high regard. Larger, more ferocious felines, such as lions, were deified. This high-class woman is shown before an offering table, and below is her pet monkey eating a fig, and she bears the lotus flower on her head. Such life-filled scenes became commonplace in a village founded by the 18th dynasty pharaoh Amenhotep I son of Ahmosa. A unique village where he and his mother, Ahmosa Nefertari, became gods. The village of Deir el Medina was founded to house the workmen and their families who built the tombs for the royals on the western bank of the Nile. This unique place allows us an interesting look into their everyday lives. We might think of furniture as something modern, but here, in this display case, we have examples from Deir al Medina with such amazing details that we think of as modern, such as window shutters. Here we have window shutters from 3,400 years ago, from the village that Amenhotep I founded, Deir el Medina. We are incredibly lucky that much of the furniture from Deir el Medina remains. From exquisite day beds, to the baskets that they would carry livestock in, to small objects like this fly swatter to provide a different kind of comfort, and the chair of a noble with the legs of a lion. The people of Deir al Medina lived in relatively more comfortable situations than the general public, as they served the pharaoh and the royal family directly. Many of the pieces from Deir al Medina were found by Champollion and Rossolini. However, some of the pieces were found by the founder of the Egyptian section of the Archaeological Museum, Ernesto Scaparelli. He found many pieces that are familiar to us today, like dice, a tomb worker's satchel, and a delicate woman's handbag. Party life at Deir al-Medina was filled with the sounds of harps, flutes, lyres, and percussion. Amenhotep I brought about a new age in funerary practices. This mummified form of the pharaoh inside a stone sarcophagus would do his work in the afterlife. These new forms go back to the tradition of funerary figurines. As now the Egyptians believed you needed to do the work yourself, these figurines could be woken up and made to do the job for you. Along with papyrus and wall inscriptions, these figurines would assist you to make your next life more comfortable. They would only place one of these inside your tomb as your double, hence why they are in the form of your mummy. This early 18th dynasty practice was short-lived and soon replaced by hundreds of figurines inside the tomb to do your bidding. These servants of the dead were called Shabtis. Each Shabti had a specific role written out on its body in sacred magical texts. Neferenpet, a vizier in the early 18th dynasty, had this Shabti wearing a special ceremonial cloak 
in the form of himself placed in his final resting place. The tomb in the 18th dynasty became the House of Eternity. A short-lived practice was having the owners of the tomb carved onto the wall, greeting their mummified body as it arrived during the funeral. Home and tomb paintings became very elaborate around the reign of Tutmosis III. The style could be seen due to an influx of people from other countries bringing tribute to Egypt. These patent textiles from the foreigners had a big artistic influence. A tomb fragment from the time of Tutmosis III shows a bald man with a full beard, very un-Egyptian. He is most likely from the land of Amuru. During this time, gifts flowed in from all around Egypt, as its empire had largely expanded. Copper from Assyria, gold from Nubia, silver from Greece, and ivory from Punt. In tombs such as these, the differences between the cultures are very noticeable, yet the similarities shine through. A young Egyptian boy held by the arm, and a Nubian boy held in the same position by his father. In life, some women of a higher class could have attendants helping them to fulfill their every wish. From preparing meals to helping with hair and makeup, Egyptian servants were well respected and in many cases became part of the family. Female servants were given clothing, housing and many other benefits. You see, in ancient Egypt, women had many more equal rights than any other civilization. Then or now. These ancient women were allowed to work, make decisions about the family, inherit, own property, and marry whomever so they wished. Monogamy was generally practiced by everyday people in Egypt, apart from the pharaoh who was allowed to have multiple wives. There are the odd exceptions, such as the scribe Humasha, who had his two wives shown on this marriage statue. This rare statue shows his two wives, their five children, their two grown-up daughters, and their two grandchildren. In the 18th and 19th dynasty, marriage statues became common practice. Usually, a marriage statue shows a couple holding each other by the waist. However, this is a supportive statue showing the whole family holding each other by the shoulders. Just like today, not all marriages end happily. Tui, the wife of the treasurer of Amun, had her husband deliberately chiseled out of their marriage statue. Women and men in ancient Egypt were allowed to divorce on grounds of many causes, from adultery to theft. If you got divorced, it was customary to have the spouse who had wronged you removed from any statue or image. Cutting a mark on the face, such as the eyes, nose, or mouth, would take away the person's spirit that was attached to that image. Not all objects in a museum need to be on a grand scale to be classified as a masterpiece. This woman is one of my absolute favorites. Although much of her is missing, 
such as her arms, inlaid eyes, nose, mouth, and clip-on linen, the carving on this 18th dynasty woman is exquisite. Spanning from pre-dynastic times until the late period, concubines of the dead were small female figurines placed in men's tombs to fulfill sexual and reproductive needs in the next life. The time of conceiving children and giving birth was some of the most interesting and dangerous times to the ancient Egyptians. Protecting the female fertility was paramount. These strange ivory boomerang-shaped objects were crucial during childbirth. In essence, they were a magic wand to draw a protective spell around the pregnant woman. The hippo goddess Tawaret became the protector of feminine pregnancy. Many women sought out Tawaret to help them conceive and protect their birth. A blue faience hippo in the form of Tawaret, decorated with Nile plant life, is a reminder of the ferocious energy a female hippo uses to protect her young. The principal wife of Tutmosis III, Meret Ra, is often shown in the guise of the goddess Hathor, the goddess of love, beauty, music, and motherhood. This unusual stela shows Meret Ra and Tutmosis III on the right appearing as the god Amun Min, Min being the representative of male fertility and virility. With his erect, circumcised penis shown together, these two symbolically represent the prosperity of the land. Under Tutmosis III, Hathor gained a high prevalence. Many people were shown in the process of becoming one with Hathor, applying makeup. A great thing is that we have some of these mirrors that we see shown in the tombs to provide us with an even stronger connection to these people. We even have their eyeliner that they used to use in everyday life. But looking good wasn't enough. You had to smell good too. And everybody in ancient Egypt desired perfume. Certain smells and certain cosmetics were connected with different events and different deities. This cosmetic box belonged to an old man who had different eyeliners inside each vial for a different purpose. Cosmetics in Egypt were big business. The richest people had the most luxurious cosmetics, including many different types of perfumes and face creams. The poorer people simply used coal to apply to the eyes. Not all of Florence's Egyptian secrets are ancient. Some modern ones are in plain sight at some of the city's most famous monuments. It was here on the famous Ponte Vecchio that Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter rented an apartment where they would stay on their travels to Egypt. We aren't sure which one of these is theirs, but it's definitely one of them. The position was perfect nearby the Egyptian Museum where they had donated several artifacts and nearby their photographer friend Harry Burton who, as a matter of fact, lived right over here. It was on this street that Harry Burton and his wife Minnie lived and actually in this house right here Many visits took place between Howard Carter 
and Lord Carnarvon. Visits a hundred years ago that would make history. Harry Burton moved to Italy in 1896, where he began to work as a photographer at the Museo Archeologico. There, he met the rich American Theodore Davies, who funded many archeological digs in Egypt. A bombastic man that forced many of his discoveries took Harry along to capture the moment. From there, he managed to meet Howard Carter. The self-taught Egyptologist had already been working in Egypt for many years, even working alongside Theodore Davies. But luckily, Carter met Lord Carnarvon, who funded his excavations. And from that, they had their most important discovery. Funded by Lord Carnarvon on the 4th of November 1922 at Howard Carter's excavation, a young water boy found the steps into the tomb of Tutankhamun. During that discovery, Harry Burton took his most famous photographs. Using large glass plate photography, Harry Burton faced his biggest challenge. His unique images would capture the world's imagination and begin the phenomena of Egyptomania. Captured faithfully by Harry Burton, a year and a half after they discovered the tomb, they saw the golden sarcophagus of the king. It was not until the 28th of October, 1925, that they finally laid their eyes on the most beautiful piece in Egyptian art, the golden death mask of Tutankhamun. And we have these marvelous images from a chance meeting at the museum in Florence. Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had made many discoveries. Unfortunately, these were never as famous as Tutankhamun. Their excavations reveal some of the finest details in Egyptian objects. In 1903, Howard Carter began to re-excavate Tomb 20 in the Valley of the Kings. The tomb that was reused by female pharaoh Hatshepsut after her father. The same year, Howard Carter discovered KV-60, the supposed final resting place of Queen Hatshepsut. Both of these tombs were filled with various debris from grave goods, all pertaining to Hatshepsut. When Hatshepsut's husband died, there was a gap because the next pharaoh was too young. She claimed the throne and became full pharaoh. Although Hatshepsut's reign was fairly successful, her successor, Tutmosis III, did his best to take her name out of history. But looking upon the items from her tomb, today we can still remember the great female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. This pharaoh led many trade campaigns, particularly to the land of Punt, where she acquired the myrrh incense she needed to create her favorite perfume. Punt, the land believed to be modern-day Eritrea or Ethiopia, provided an array of botanical goods to enrich Egypt. Her expeditions to Punt were well documented in her mortuary temple at Deir al-Bahri, a place well documented by Howard Carter. In the early 1900s, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon discovered the tomb of Queen Hatshepsut. Unfortunately, all of the pieces in the tomb have been taken out during grave robbings. However, some very interesting pieces remain that were of no interest to grave robbers, such as these little incredible wooden figurines of farm implements like wheelbarrows and pickaxes, and everyday items like a knife, reed mats, and baskets. What we have here is Hatshepsut's perfume. Well, the most amazing thing is the perfume is still inside the bottle.
And these are just some of the pieces that Howard Carter, Lord Carnarvon, donated to this museum. Howard Carter, a man who barely finished school and who received all of his archaeological and Egyptological training in the field, is now seen as one of the most important Egyptologists in history and one of the most educated Egyptologists in history. An unknown fact is that Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had found many tombs and unexplored places before they had found the tomb of Tutankhamun. And a lot of these pieces were then donated to some of their favorite museums around the world, including the museum in Florence. Just three pharaohs down the line from Hatshepsut, we meet one of Egypt's most peaceful and respected rulers, Amenhotep III. Much of his warfare was done through words. And it's through these words of Amenhotep III that we know much about his policies and life. Queen T, the great royal wife of Amenhotep III, the wife whose wedding he bragged about to the entire land of Egypt. Many international policies were made directly through this woman. She had a firm grip on Egypt, even after the death of her husband. A powerful woman unlike any other, grandmother to Tutankhamun and mother to the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. Ptahmos, meaning born of the god Ptah, was the chief tax keeper under the reign of Amenhotep III. This statue shows Ptahmos holding an offering table for tributes and taxes. The side indicates that the statue was commissioned by his son, Hedge. This statue was found in Thebes in 1791 and is one of the most elaborately carved statues from the period, from his kilt to his fingers to his elaborately decorated wig, eye makeup and pierced ears, even his small details of his shirt. On the shoulder of his dress is the name of Amenhotep. Many have thought that he was the same Ptahmos that was the vizier succeeded by Ramosa. However, evidence from Ptahmos's tomb, the vizier's tomb, and his stela prove that the tax keeper and him are not the same person. His predecessor was Meri Ra, who was also given the title of the one who cares for the king's personal belongings, which means it's the same job that Ptahmos would have done. He was promoted to this position in year 30 of the king's reign. His job was to collect taxes, set the tariffs, and meet with foreign dignitaries. an 18th dynasty man holding one of the highest ranks for an official during the reign of Amenhotep III was named Hui. Hui was the son of the mayor of Memphis and the brother of the vizier Ramosa. This stela shows Hui on the right and his son Ipi on the left. Ippi succeeded him in being the high steward under the reign of the new pharaoh, Akhenaten. Another man named Ptahmos from the reign of Amenhotep III, yet this man was not the tax inspector. He was the high priest of the Memphite god, Ptah. The complex god, Ptah, was mainly worshipped 
in the north of Egypt. His origins dating back to the Old Kingdom, he served many purposes, including master of the architects, patron of craftsmen. At one stage, he even became associated with the Creator God and with Osiris, the God of the Dead. The statue was the first ever acquisition by the museum in Florence. It was first housed at the Uffizi in 1753. High Priest of Ptah, Ptahmos, even makes an appearance in the famous painting Tribuna of the Uffizi from the mid-1700s. The son of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, when he became pharaoh, shook the country to its core. He introduced a new art style to the people that had never been seen before. And, most importantly, he disregarded all the gods of Egypt in favor of his one god, Aten. This pharaoh was to be worshipped, and his wife, Nefertiti. Only through them could your prayers reach the gods. This unstable time saw the destruction of many statues of the king and queen after their rule, as is evident from the ruins of these royal feet. It wasn't all that bad during Akhenaten and Nefertiti's reign. The pharaoh handed out many extravagant gifts including some of the most fine linen garments, as shown on tomb walls of nobles at the time. If you were willing to serve Akhenaten, he would treat you well, no matter what class you were from. This man clearly wanted to show that he could afford a wig, showing his wig as transparent, with his shaved head visible underneath, the sign of nobility. One of the highest nobles from the reign of Amenhotep III and the early years of Akhenaten. His death mask made out of fine cartonage and linen and finely decorated with beautiful details. He was the brother of High Steward Hui and the son of the mayor of Memphis. Ramosa was a vizier during the time of Akhenaten and Amenhotep III. He disappeared from history because of his opposing religious views compared to Akhenaten. And Ramosa's tomb, which is one of the most beautiful tombs I've ever been into, Everything is white limestone, with only the black for the eyes laid out. We do not have Ramosa's mummy, but we do have his cartonage death mask, made in the same style as his tomb, white, with only the black for the eyes. He is absolutely beautiful. His mummy has never been found. Sinisterly, his death mask was filled in with mud. Maybe. His body was never laid to rest. This granite bust shows the army general of Akhenaten and the future pharaoh, Horemheb. Horemheb played a big part when Tutankhamun became the pharaoh after Akhenaten. This fragment from his tomb in Saqqara shows us the young Tut. During the reigns of Tutankhamun, his successor I, and Pharaoh Horemheb, Egypt became prosperous once again, for the only reason that they abandoned Akhenaten's new religion and new city, returned to Thebes, and reinstated the gods. And under these post-Amana rulers, ancient Egypt's plethora of gods began to become favorable again. 
and the people began to worship the way they used to. And their most revered practice of entering the afterlife became attainable once again. The former gods had returned. And of them all, none more important than Osiris, the god who allowed you into heaven. Anubis, the god that led you to Osiris, began to rise in prevalence once again. The old burial practices returned, where Anubis would lead you to the next world. A world pretty similar to ours, only as a paradise. Tombs from the late 18th dynasty show the prosperity and the thoughtfulness that people put into getting into heaven. An official mourner attending to the sarcophagus of the deceased, being held up by the priest and adorned with bouquets of flowers. Not exclusive to royals and nobles, now anybody who could afford one was allowed a tomb. By the 18th dynasty, Pyramids were no longer constructed for burials. Instead, many people at Deir al Medina began to use a shape harking back to the Pyramid Age. Placed inside the tomb, these little pyramids were called, well, Pyramidians. Connected to the sun god Ra, they served the same purpose on a smaller scale and featured on the pinnacle of a new concept known as a funerary chapel at Deir al Medina where your family could leave you offerings. The population worshipped many gods and even wrote special letters to the gods with their prayers. At Deir al Medina, several goddesses appear in the life-giving tree. A cow goddess in a tree pouring out libations, Hathor, one of the most popular gods, especially during the new 19th dynasty. During the 19th dynasty, the presence of Hathor was immense. Apart from being the goddess of love and beauty, she became the Lady of the West, and in some cases replaced Anubis to lead you to Osiris. This is a loving scene between Hathor and the second pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, the father of Ramses II, Seti I. The most amazing piece, yet it's not actually very well looked after. It should be inside a glass case. It's from the tomb of Seti I, found by Giovanni Belzoni. In 1871, the Italian explorer Giovanni Belzoni discovered the longest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. The craftsmen of Seti's reign, in my opinion, were the highest skilled of all. Paying attention to even the smallest details, the pharaoh's name in beautiful technicolor standing next to Hathor. The subtle contours on the body of the pharaoh exude elegance. Hathor's decorated hair fit for a goddess and the pharaoh's golden sandals with his long, elegant feet. The king holding hands with the lady of the west. Due to the humid European conditions, much of the paint is dissolving away. From a four-sided pillar, the twin of this scene can be found in the Louvre in Paris.
preserved in a glass case, the colors are faithfully visible today. Seti I, one of the most prolific pharaohs, maintained Egypt's wider borders. He venerated the gods and started the biggest building project in the land, expanding Egypt's economy and laying out the foundations for his son and future pharaoh, Ramses II. Many of the incredible artifacts in this museum were found by the great Italian explorer Giovanni Belzoni in the 1800s. During the 19th century, Egyptian antiquities attracted the attention of scholars, scientists, travelers, adventurers, and glorified tomb raiders. In the early 1800s, it resulted in the coming together of three extraordinary men. These were Henry Salt, Giovanni Belzoni, and Muhammad Ali Pasha. Henry Salt was a British consul general in Egypt. He came from a prosperous background. His father was a local physician. This gave him the means to study portrait painting. Unfortunately, he failed to build the reputation he had hoped for, but he managed to get a lucky break traveling across the globe as draftsman for a British lord. These voyages led to diplomatic and scholarly attainments and eventually the position of consul general in Egypt. Belzoni, on the other hand, was the son of a barber, a profession which deservedly has been much more appreciated during the recent COVID lockdowns. Belzoni, however, didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps, so as a teenager, he rebelled and had other plans for himself. After being dumped by his girlfriend at 18, Belzoni was brokenhearted. His solution was to forget about girls and devote himself to God and join a monastery. The universe, however, had other plans for him and events led him to fleeing Italy and becoming a circus strongman in England. It is in England where he would meet his soulmate and devoted wife, Sarah, an intrepid travel companion, a major player in every aspect of his life. It's his training in hydraulics, however, that changed both their lives and led them to Egypt and Balzani face to face with the fearless Muhammad Ali Pasha. If I had to describe Balzani in a few words, he would probably be impulsive for sure, innovative, resilient, determined, charismatic, tall and strong very strong. In fact, if he lived in this day and age, he would be a social media sensation and probably have millions of followers on Instagram. Muhammad Ali, the Pasha of Egypt, although shorter in stature to girls only six foot seven inches, was also innovative and responsible for modernizing Egypt improving Egypt's irrigation system and many other reforms at any cost, including gifting away countless Egyptian antiquities. It is in this social milieu that Belzoni, failing in his bid to sell his hydraulic machine to the Pasha, led him to discovering and transporting Egyptian antiquities and being introduced to Henry Sold. This would be the start of something resembling an Indiana Jones type movie where Belzoni would encounter obstacles, rivalry, assassination attempts and betrayal. Henry Salt managed to convince Belzoni to move a colossal granite head of Ramesses II weighing over a staggering seven tons. Many had failed to do this Belzoni succeeded due to his engineering skills and using methods very similar to those the ancient Egyptians used. 
this was an arduous task, as you can imagine, in the grueling Egyptian heat. But it made Salt aware of what an incredible man and how useful Belzoni was to him. This momentous statue now resides in the British Museum and attracts visitors from all over the world. For Belzoni, he marked the beginning of many discoveries and the transportation of Egyptian artifacts to the British Museum and other European museums. To Belzoni's dismay, Salt ensured all the glory and recognition went to him rather than to Belzoni. The artifacts delivered to the museums became known as the Salt Collection. Perhaps seeing Belzoni as an employee, he didn't feel the need to give him the recognition which Belzoni obviously felt he deserved. This led to Belzoni ensuring temples and tombs he discovered displayed his name and the date of discovery. His wife, Sarah, also needs to be mentioned because she was instrumental in his discoveries and her input is often ignored. On arriving back in England, the Belzonis ensured that his version of events was documented, leading to the publication of a book which became an overnight sensation in several countries. This book for a short time earned Belzoni the fame that he had dreamt of. Belzoni probably achieved what he wanted and that is for all us museum visitors questioning every artifact we see labeled as the Salt Collection. We're going to be asking, is this actually part of the Salt Collection? Or is this glorious artifact that's been taken from Egypt the result of a unique set of skills, imagination, and ingenuity of a complex, fascinating man called Giovanni Belzoni. Many pieces discovered by Belzoni go uncredited, such as this beautiful image from Seti's tomb of the goddess of truth and justice, Ma'at, named here as the daughter of Ra, identified by the ostrich feather. Belzoni discovered countless tombs throughout Egypt, filled with some of the most beautiful treasures, including these alabaster canopic jars, still containing the mummified organs. In the completely looted tomb, he discovered hundreds of Shabtis of Seti I. Seti's son and successor, Ramses II, seen here in a small bust with an obelisk behind, reminiscent of the one in Florence. Today, we marvel in awe at the monuments of ancient Egypt, but who built these godly structures? Well-trained and skilled men were hired to create the empire. This scene shows many men at work in everyday life. Even one man stopping to look at us saying, what are you doing? While his scribal colleague designs the text for the back of the statue. The designer of Seti's tomb was a man called Baki and Baki lived at Deir al-Medina, where he drew this giant ostraca, the initial design of Seti's tomb. The tomb was then finished by a man called Pashidu, and Pashidu went on to design the tomb of Queen Nefertari. An ostraca was basically an ancient piece of notepaper where we can see the scribe practicing the pharaoh's profile before it became permanent. At the back of the Seti Ostraca is a young Prince Ramses II. A piece that has come from one of Egypt's most sacred sites, Abydos. Here we see Ramses II, beautifully depicted with his elaborately decorated crown and his huge name written here, Wusudmaitra, 
Ramses. And he is holding an offering of two bracelets and a necklace to the god. Holding out the offerings to Osiris, Ramses is even shown here wearing a combination of different crowns. One included is the crown of the god of the afterlife, Osiris. It's undeniable that Ramses profile is one of the most distinctive. Well known for his military victories, but what physical ties remain? This is one of the most amazing pieces found in the tomb of Prince Ramses, the son of Ramses II. Artifacts that belonged to his father. This kilt that would have been worn by Ramses II, made out of some of the finest linen. It's incredible to be so close to something so personal, owned by a pharaoh. Other such artifacts include this dagger, with a wooden handle topped with two falcons. Woven reed sandals that were probably worn by the prince himself. And interestingly, an intact wig made from straight human hair and painstakingly plaited. And the lid of a wooden makeup box beautifully marked with the pharaoh's name in blue. Prince Ramses, the firstborn son from his second principal wife, was just one of over 100 children produced by Ramses II. Another man named Ramosa and his wife Tay were one of the wealthiest couples who lived at Deir el Medina during Ramses II's reign. His role was as chief scribe to Ramses. Ramosa worked alongside the vizier, Passer, to build up the following cult of the living god that was the pharaoh. Ramosa and Tay were well looked after by Ramses, as is evident in their well-designed clothing and the tomb to allow them to meet with the god of the afterlife. Remnants of blue paint are still visible on Osiris on this stela. The wife of Osiris, Isis, and her sister, Nephthys, shown with their beautiful blue lapis hair, identified by the symbols on their head. The exquisite detailing on this stela proves that Ramosa and Tay were a cut above the others as they could afford only the best craftsmanship. Eating a date with a lotus above her head before the offerings from her son, their daughter pouring out oils and incense for the couple's spirit. Beside the chair of the nobles, their grandchildren enjoying fruit, a glimpse at ancient family dynamics. Ramses II had one of the longest reigns of any Egyptian pharaoh. One of his many viziers that was around at the end of his father's reign and the beginning of his was called Passer. He served the royal court as vizier and high priest of Amun for over 50 years. Ramses afforded Passer a tomb. In the tomb, he placed a foundation stone displaying his titles. This is a pillar from the tomb of Petamos from Saqqara. Petamos was named as mayor in Memphis by Seti I after he served in battle with Ramses and Seti. We can see here Sekhmet shown at the top of the pillar. As we go down we see Petamos shown as the mayor. As we go down we see him as a priest 
his first role being a priest. And he is holding the staff. But what is so interesting about this is that we get an idea of young Ramses II. Here at the back, we can see young Prince Ramses II with his side lock, very distinctly Ramses II. and his brother Ptah Ser, who was the army general of Ramses II, were both given tombs in Saqqara. Their tombs were discovered in 1885 by Theodore Davies, the man who spent much time at the museum in Florence. Even though there was much warfare during the reign of Ramses II, the people enjoyed a utopian-type lifestyle, as was written by residents and foreign allies. An exquisite colored scene from the tomb of Parser at Saqqara displays an array of beautiful priestesses pouring out the abundant harvests for Patamos. He carefully selects a succulent fig for his delectation. This is not fantasy for we still have the urns used to pour the water out. Baskets of mummified figs, dates, pomegranates and coconuts have been found, which we can see on the walls. The tomb of Patamos shows us the agricultural success and the beauty of Ramses II's reign. It is a wonderful thing to see items that were used by people in everyday life. Items that were selected with care and grace. Items that bring the life and the death of the ancient Egyptians to reality. By the end of the 19th dynasty, there was an influx in mummification, and thousands of sarcophagi were mass-produced from workshops for burials, pretty similar to modern-day funeral parlors. There were even different levels of mummification that you could choose from. Late 19th dynasty officials could afford well-crafted funerary objects. From royal attendants, to singers from the temple, all the way down to even one of Ramses III's horse stable managers. It would appear that the stable manager could not afford a decorated tomb and thus he had his sarcophagus decorated with the gods he wanted to appease. The innovation of writing texts for the dead on papyrus during the 18th dynasty would become fully fledged in the 19th dynasty and used even more in the 20th dynasty. Scribes would produce a selection of funeral texts in order to help the deceased reach the afterlife. These books of the dead meant that the complex texts from the tombs could be condensed into a papyrus scroll. The end of the 20th dynasty saw a decline in Egypt's economy, meaning many tombs were then reused, raided or destroyed. The high priests gained more control and would become more powerful than the pharaoh. At the start of the 21st dynasty, the country was divided between north and south. The pharaohs receded to the north and the high priests ruled in the south. Now their lives and burials became even more extravagant. 
This divide led Egypt into its third intermediate period, and chaos ensued. Taking advantage of the divide, the Meshwish, a division of the Libyan tribes, took power over the north and claimed themselves to be pharaohs. Even adopting Egyptian customs, building tombs in Tanis, they were interred like the Egyptian kings before them. The hands at the sides was a sign of a commoner in a mummification in ancient Egypt. Arms crossed over the chest with clenched fists indicates a pharaoh. This male mummy and yellow coffin date to the 22nd Libyan dynasty. All the signs indicate that he could be one of the great Libyan pharaohs of the Third Intermediate Period, although his coffin is too damaged to reveal a name. Evidence of insert holes on his brow and chin indicate a royal cobra and beard. The Nubians to the south seized the moment and took power over Egypt, forming the new 25th dynasty. Tashriprenret, the nanny of the daughter of Pharaoh Taharqa. She looked after Amun Yidris. And here we have the nanny's death mask. It's probably the biggest death mask I've ever seen. It is absolutely enormous. But think about in the 25th dynasty, when Princess Amun Yidris was adopted from Nubia by an Egyptian priestess, and this Egyptian woman looked after her. And before that, Taharqa, who was ruling Egypt as a Nubian at that time, had her put into such an elaborate burial. Hashrepranret raised Amun Yidris, who would eventually become the god's wife of Amun and rule Thebes on behalf of her father. A temple was built at Medinet Habu in Thebes, where she was interred in her tomb. Taharqa afforded Tashrepranret an elaborate tomb in Thebes. Her sarcophagus and burial shrine is one of the largest and most unique in the history of Egyptian burials. Tashrepranret wears the vulture crown connecting her to the goddess and wife of Amun, Mut. A wood and silver mirror in its protective case and eyeliner were some of the many objects found in Tanshrepranret's tomb. Ruling Egypt for less than 100 years, the Nubians fought off the Assyrians but were eventually chased out of Egypt by the native Egyptians. A line of weaker Egyptians were now on the throne. Soon, they were conquered by a new power from the north, known as the Persians, forming the 27th dynasty. Needless to say, the Persian rulers made life unbearable for the Egyptians. This burial of a 27th dynasty singer proves that coffins were no longer individually made and had to be produced from what was available. Eventually, the Egyptians took back power, only to lose it again to the invading foreigners, the Persians. Their salvation would arrive from an unexpected Greek Macedonian man who liberated the Egyptians. 
we don't often see Alexander the Great depicted as an Egyptian or even as a pharaoh, only on a couple of statues and carvings. However, here we have something so unique. It is Alexander depicted as the god Hapi before an offering table with fish and plants hanging off the offering table. Isn't he just the most magnificent example of Greek and Egyptian art combined? When Alexander chased out the Persians from Egypt, he was named as the son of Amun and became Pharaoh. Uncontested by the Egyptians, he started a new line of Greek Ptolemaic rulers. He stayed less than six months, but he left a mark that was immense. One of my favorite pieces at the Archaeological Museum in Firenze is also one of the smallest. It is a silver coin showing Alexander the Great as a pharaoh. This small silver coin shows Alexander the Great and the goddess Hera on the back. We can tell that it's Alexander from his distinct features and his hair and also the name being on the back of the coin. However, a telltale sign to know that this is Alexander after he became a pharaoh is he is wearing the ram's horns showing that this is Alexander after he became pharaoh as he was named also as the son of Amun. One of Alexander the Great's favorite things that he found when he came to Egypt was the hoopoe bird, and he had it depicted in many temples. And this here is the favorite bird of Alexander the Great. Alexander's chosen successor to rule Egypt was Ptolemy. After Ptolemy came a phenomenal woman who became a female pharaoh, Arsinoe. The Ptolemies were a complicated lot, to say the least, and one of the most famous was the great queen and pharaoh Cleopatra VII. The patron goddess of Cleopatra, the one she most associated herself with, the one that she believed she was the reincarnation of, was the eternal mother goddess, Isis. Isis suckling her child Horus, the next pharaoh. Many bronzes were made in the forms of the gods as they believed bronze was a living metal, for when it oxidized, it grew green mold, which showed the metal was alive. This solitary 4,600-year-old god grew in popularity under the Ptolemies. Imhotep, the architect of the world's first ever pyramid, The museum in Florence yet again surprises us with more tangible links to the ancient world. Objects that look as familiar to us as they did to people 3,000 years ago. From beanies to tunics, even woven socks. Objects that we even use today, such as these embroidered slippers. And a cloak with a hood that we would never have thought was worn millennia ago. There's something fascinating about staring at the face of an ancient Egyptian. This white painted face, once gilded in gold, inlaid with precious stones for the eyes. 
These faces from different dynasties across Egyptian history were originally on coffins. In modern times, when tombs were raided, the faces were cut off of the coffin to be sold to a tourist who could easily pack it in their bag. The inhumane desecration of Egyptian artifacts did not only happen in modern times. Two thousand years ago, after the fall of ancient Egyptian religion, the Christian Coptics who lived in Egypt painted the cross over the sacred writings, taking away their pagan meaning. After the death of Cleopatra, the new Roman emperors who ruled Egypt still depicted themselves as pharaohs. Un-Egyptian people showing themselves in Egyptian style. In the first century AD, settlements in the Siwa Oasis and Fayum still depicted themselves in Egyptian style but with a mix of Greek and Roman. In the 4th century AD, the wine producers in Fayum who had been around for centuries still created death masks, a lifelike image beautifully crafted out of wood and wax paint. An unsurpassable culture with its monuments that have stood for thousands of years and that will be here far longer after we are all gone, Egypt is indeed the den of antiquity. Florence, a city filled with thousands of years of a rich cultural history spanning all the way back to ancient Egypt.